So it's giving me an error. So it's hard to it's hard to verify that I'm actually live because it's actually giving me an error on YouTube. So we shall see if there's actually any comments here. If you can see me live here, let me know. Sorry about that. You know, the initial step is always like difficult here. The first, uh, the first part of the broadcast is always, uh, is always challenging because of this multi-platform thing. So I'm on uh, Rumble and I'm also on YouTube. Last, last week, the Rumble crowd was much bigger than YouTube, surprisingly, much, much bigger, like a thousand viewers on, on uh, Rumble, more. So that was kind of amazing. So welcome, guys. Okay, so we looks like we are seeing things. So let me, uh, we're seeing comments and seeing things, but we're seeing comments. So let me just uh, bring up the Rumble side here in case there are comments there. In case I come up, I don't see myself yet on there, so I'm just going to keep an eye on it and see what happens there. So okay, guys. So welcome. And as I said uh, last week, was a pretty big broadcast night on Rumble. I don't know if they coordinated doing the editor's pick for live this week. So we'll see. We'll see what happens and we're not going to go worry about it. It's really been a bad week for me from a numbers point of view, from a numbers point of view, because my video, my last video I had to, to uh, remove because the comments won't appear. Then I reposted the video and the comments still didn't appear. And uh, it, it basically knocked it out of uh, contention, so to speak. It was actually doing well, and now it's not. So, uh, yeah, so it's kind of what it is. And then the algorithm kind of punishes you. It's their own fault. You know, the algorithm uh, screwed up, or there was a bug on, on YouTube. They screwed up, and then I get punished for it. So, anyway, that's what it is. I'm not going to go worry about it. I'm just here to provide service for those who can actually pay attention. So the format again is one half hour of me talking about the topic and then uh, I'll pay more attention to the comments in the second half of this after the 30 minute mark. So the topic tonight is, is kind of interesting and hopefully that, you know, that uh, the lighting is quite subdued. Uh, is it subdued on it's not subdued it's, it's actually pretty balanced here so I couldn't tell you if it's subdued on my end here so is that a problem otherwise it's like it's super super bright so okay so yeah I mean Often it's like you know stark stark bright and it's not it's not it's just like total darkness in here. So anyway, so the topic is big tech against big tech. Now this is kind of a long story for the future. I'm not gonna do the whole story tonight, uh, but I'll do part of it and I'll tell you about uh, some of the actions that big tech has taken, which may seem kind of suspicious, uh, you know, as far as, you know, what, what, why they're doing it. And some of you actually think, oh, they're doing it for me. They're doing it for my privacy. Oh, they're doing good stuff. Uh, actually, it's not. It's, uh, there are many things that they're doing, uh, Apple and Google specifically here. That's what I'm talking about tonight, Apple and Google. They're doing things specifically to bash other companies, other tech companies. They're basically consolidating. And, uh, and this is very powerful and this can be used in a different way which I'll talk about in the different videos I'm not gonna get into that part of it but I'll tell you some of the battles that have actually happened some of them have already happened in the past like you know a few years ago uh, against a company called Symantec the company that used to be Symantec <clears throat> which uh, doesn't exist anymore so yeah there's no there's no Symantec anymore but the old Symantec was uh, was was hit by this tech to tech battle, and uh, this uh, this week we saw the evidence of the tech to tech battle between Apple and Zuckbook. 
And if you uh, if you have been haven't been watching the news, Zuckbook uh, lost uh, Zuck himself lost seventy billion seventy seven zero billion in value of his own uh, uh, stocks in Facebook seventy billion. So it's down down to like he's down to like fifty billion. So it's more than half of his of his uh, equity went down and it's projected that the advertising revenue as a result of what Apple has done to Facebook and actually Google too uh, will cost Facebook 10 billion 10 billion so Facebook is uh, yeah Facebook it's looking bad for Facebook right now looking bad for Facebook now as you all know well maybe not all of you but I'm uh, I'm uh, pretty pretty against two companies in, in big tech, particularly as far as you know the worst of the worst, and the uh, the two companies that to me are the worst of the worst are Symantec, which is now gone, and Facebook. And Facebook is definitely suffering here. Let me just tell you why. I'll tell you the Symantec story too. But let me just tell you why about Facebook. See, Facebook. <coughs> has played tricks on you that is like really inconceivable that anyone would do. Uh, you know, first of all, they did facial recognition on anything you posted on Facebook. They did facial recognition and they started tracking people and tracking who knows who and tracking relationships. You know, they even went to the extent that if you are even near somebody in location, they were so obsessed, Zuck was so, so obsessed with invading your privacy that they would recommend friends as some, you know, somebody that sat next to you in a bar, and they would recommend that person as a friend on Facebook just from proximity. And then one of the worst tricks that Facebook started to do was was to uh, um, track MAC addresses. Now this is truly, truly evil, truly, truly evil MAC addresses. So what what happened here is that Facebook started to track uh, like you know, the MAC addresses, I'm looking on Rumble here because somebody mentioned I'm on Rumble, but I, I'm i not, I don't see myself on the live, oh, there it is. I, I, I'm, I'm on the, I see myself in the live section. Okay, so I'm watching the comments on Rumble here too. So, so uh, Facebook started to track MAC addresses. Now this is truly evil because before, before that, MAC addresses were not known as a threat to anyone because MAC addresses don't cross the internet. MAC addresses are a local piece of, identif of identification that can identify devices only on your local network. So unless, somebody, unless you're spying on a local network, you can't see the MAC address. Like a Google or, uh, or any other entity can't see the MAC address because it doesn't cross the internet normally, normally. Now Google and Apple can see the MAC address of your phones because they put it in the code of iOS and Google. And uh, since Android, uh, I believe nine, I believe since Android nine, they locked out the ability of apps to see the MAC address. And that was a direct attack on Facebook. <clears throat> that was directly against Facebook because Facebook was doing that and they were abusing abusing the, the data. And the reason that Facebook wanted to get the MAC address was so that if Facebook is on any network spotting MAC addresses, even if they're not on your home network, for example, your, your home network, it spots all the MAC addresses of all the devices, especially mobile devices in the area, meaning in your house. And then you go to Walmart and uh, somebody is using Facebook and Walmart Whoever's using Facebook on Walmart can now spot all the MAC addresses around the area on Walmart. And then by doing that, they can say, oh, uh, this device is over here. This device is near me. And it can actually draw in inferences about where you're going and who you're related to and who you're connected to simply by being on, on, uh, on a network that has some user of Facebook on it to check the MAC addresses. It's really, really like an extreme form of spying that, that Zuck was doing. And it was highly, highly irritating that, because we, the, uh, you know, it's pretty difficult to battle that because it's pretty sneaky. 
And so Google did that. They, they blocked MAC addresses. Apple tried. They didn't succeed with blocking MAC addresses back. Uh, I think they tried in uh, iOS 9, I believe. They, did, they tried it, and then it didn't work. It, it caused bugs. And then Google tried a, a different variety, ver, version of it later on. What Google does now is semi keeps the, uh, the MAC address constant per connection. But if you disconnect from the network, it, it randomizes the MAC address. And that's, again, to basically to fight Facebook. So if you're in, at Walmart, your phone will, have, will appear with a different MAC address. So, so what they did recently now is start to block the ads that are coming, you know, the, that, that Facebook can spy on you on, on any phone. And they were like uh, writing the coattails of Apple and Google by putting themselves into your apps and uh, you know, you know, with the Facebook like button and spying through that and doing browser fingerprinting and all the good stuff that comes with that. And uh, that's been blocked, blocked two ways. First of all, <clears throat> advertising now is uh, required to be done through uh, an advertising identifier, which Google, I mean, Apple, sorry, uh, is now setting to a default of off. And then the second part of it is, is uh, is uh, Apple is doing the iCloud private relay, and you know, and not even allowing them to track the the, the uh, IP addresses. So all of this, you you might think is is for the purpose of giving you privacy, but it's actually a fight to fight against Facebook. So Facebook is losing so much revenue because they're not able to spy on your phone as they used to. And uh, in, in fact, Google is doing or was doing. I don't know if actually they're continue to do it to do this they're doing uh, uh, the cohort business the what is it the uh, forget the name of the the plan but the plan is to to take away browser fingerprinting and then and then track people through cohorts but through Google only so an outsider can't do a browser fingerprint only Google can fingerprint you uh, external parties cannot and again the reason for that is to block out the Facebook and so on let me tell you something else that's very interesting uh, you know, as you know, most people, the majority of people use Chrome. And what you don't know is that there's actually code in Chrome to, to do certain things, uh, to do blocking. For example, it can block uh, certain uh, certificates. It can block, uh, it has a link to Google called Safe Browsing, which is part of Safety Net, that where they can actually control what your computer can see. They can actually filter things out. If they don't want it, they can filter things out. Well, one of the things that happened a few years ago was the company Symantec, a little bit of history here, Symantec is probably one of the most evil companies I've ever encountered in my life. Symantec was, uh, was uh, you know, for primarily focused on Norton antivirus for a while. Then it uh, purchased LifeLock. Uh, by the way, I got some threats from that front, so you know, they didn't like what I was talking about. Fortunately, that company is now gone. But uh, what was happening with the with the Symantec was Symantec was playing games when they purchased Blue Coat Systems. And in case you didn't know what Blue Coat Systems is, Blue Coat Systems is is basically an entity that can spy on networks, and it's used in many countries to spy on on. It's like a mass surveillance device. So you put it on the network and it can break encryption, it can break TLS, it can break, uh, uh, meaning HTTPS. It can see what you're doing on HTTPS. It can see what you're doing on Facebook. It's like a man in the middle. It's a man in the middle kind of app. So it's very, very dangerous. And the way they did this, the way this, this evil company did this, breaking initially, they, they have many ways, but this is one of the ways they did it, the way, the way they did this, was, was, which was the most immoral, was they actually created a fake certificate, a fake root certificate, a fake root certificate. And they possessed the root certificate. If you have the root certificate, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, basically decrypt anything in the traffic because you have the certificate. So they had the certificate, they loaded it up, and the reason they had the certificate was because Symantec also owned the company that handed the certificates for most 
in in the world. Most of the certificates were uh, were handled by this one company. What's the name of the company again? I forgot. Um, you know, it's the very first company that offered SSS SSL certificates, and that was bought by Symantec. So Symantec owned LifeLock, the uh, that company that does certificates, and then uh, Blue Code Systems, and then the Norton Antivirus. Well, what what happened then is they they since they own the company that did these certificates, they said, we'll create a fake certificate, and they, they loaded it on the devices of Blue Code Systems, and then they could see everything. They could see everything. So you could, they could actually fake a Google.com account. They can fake it, so they can intercept any traffic to Google.com. It's crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Well, what's interesting here is that uh, Google has a way of finding out if if you're impersonating a certificate, and the way they did that was put the code uh, into Chrome itself, meaning instead of just leaving the certificates uh, at the servers, Chrome actually put a copy of the signature of the certificate on Chrome for Google.com. So when you run Chrome, it actually checks, are you using the actual Google.com certificate or, you know, are using one with a different signature, and they were able to, to, uh, to they were able to find out that they actually were using a different certificate, a fake one, under the control of Blue Code Systems, which was a uh, a uh, uh, next level um, certificate company below the the top level, and so if. You know, and it was approved by all because it was approved by the top level because they own that company. So, very signed. So, thank you, very signed. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. I haven't talked about this in a while, so I forget the names of the companies. Anyway, Google spotted that and they said, oh, we are going to block all semantic certificates from the internet. And we can do that in Chrome. So they actually put in Chrome a block that says, <clears throat> you guys are, you know, are faking it. You're faking our certificates. You're faking everybody's certificates, uh, meaning you're spying on the whole world and nobody knows it. We, we Google know it. So we're going to do something. And so they actually blocked their certificate. They, they basically rendered the uh, certificate holder uh, that was in charge of, uh, that, that was uh, in control of the Blue Code Systems certificates, rendered that invalid. In fact, they actually invalidated the whole semantic chain of certificates. So all of the semantic certificates no longer work. And they gave them a deadline, you know, in one year we're gonna, no, no semantic certificate is gonna work anymore. And then they, uh, they basically had no choice so Symantec then unloaded VeriSign, and VeriSign is now owned by, by another one of those companies, and so VeriSign uh, is no longer part of Symantec. Uh, Blue Coat Systems was uh, sold, and, and the corporate side of Symantec was sold to Broadcom, and, um, and uh, so what, what is left of, uh, of Symantec is basically the Norton antivirus, and now they call themselves Norton. And then LifeLock is now part of Nor Norton LifeLock. So, yeah, so now they they basically are uh, a consumer-only company. Uh, they're no longer involved in that Blue Code system stuff. They're a much smaller company, and all because of the stupid stuff that they were doing. They were, like, playing games, and, and they were, you know, doing uh, basically illegal things. And they, they never admitted to it, of course, because, you know, one of the things that was very interesting was that the president of Symantec was the president of Blue Coat Systems. So in the merger, the Symantec was taken over by the head of the spying arm. So Symantec became the, the spy company. Very, very bad spy company. And then, of course, Facebook is just like that. It's Facebook is driven by, you know, let's spy on every, every person, let's eliminate your privacy completely let's let's uh let's uh you know learn everything about you in all the ways we can find and we don't really care what technique we're going to do we're going to use them all and slowly they got beaten down they got beaten down when you know lawsuits were piled on on the 
issue of they wanted to do facial recognition on Facebook. Now that's pretty dangerous because Facebook is in the cloud. This is not like, you know, the facial recognition on, uh, on Apple where the facial recognition is on the phone. No, they want to do facial recognition in the cloud. So all you have to do is, you know, if you had a Facebook app, you could point, if, if they actually implemented this, you could just point the, the app at anyone and they, it would recognize that person. In fact, in theory, it could even recognize him in, uh, on the internet. Just put him on a photo, show a photo, and then Facebook would recognize who it is and uh, reveal it, reveal it uh, to whoever is looking. I mean, total, total loss of privacy, especially when, when people are, are uh, all on Facebook. The total evil. Well, I'm so glad. I am so glad that their evil is, is they're just like Symantec. You know, do evil and evil will bite you. Evil will bite you in the in in the in the in the zazz. So yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, Facebook, Facebook is uh, definitely damaged goods now, and it's 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 all because of this extreme extreme actions. You know, in the interest of money, they said we, we will. You know, Zuck has no respect for your privacy. He said over and over that none of you deserve any privacy. This is why I'm telling you, never go into Facebook properties, and that includes Instagram and WhatsApp. Don't go into these platforms because they cross spy among these. They can't spy on you on, on Apple and Google directly now, so they're continuing to spy, and it's in the terms of service. They will spy across WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. So. You may not know it, but they know the relationship with, between your accounts on Instagram, WhatsApp, and, uh, and uh, Facebook. In which case, you may have secret conversations. You think, you think you're having secret conversations on WhatsApp, but because you're all tied to Facebook accounts, uh, with MAC addresses and all that identified, they can actually then say, oh yeah, we know who you are. You're talking to this person over here on Facebook and interesting relationships here because uh, you're married because it says on your Facebook account, but you're you're always talking to this, you know, person of the opposite sex here on WhatsApp with certain, you know, timing conditions and all that, that just uh, becomes suspicious. And they, 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 they can do all this. They can do all this that you can't, you can't, uh, that you can't stop. So please, some of you are obs obsessed with WhatsApp and some of you are telling me, well, in my country, you know, like Brazil, you know, everyone uses WhatsApp. So I, I don't have a choice. Like there's always a choice. <clears throat> there's always a choice. So my own family was obsessed with Facebook. And I uh, said, no, you know, I left Facebook uh, uh, 20, 2012, 2013, late 2012. So it's about, yeah, it's, uh, it's basically 10 years ago. And uh, I left Facebook and deleted everything there and c completely. I've never been on WhatsApp, uh, don't have an Instagram account. And I said, nope, not going to do this because I understand kind of the risk of dealing with a company that wants to do evil like this. So fortunately for us, <clears throat> the fighting between big tech, you know, in this case, because, you know, Apple and Google are, are realizing, hey, you know, uh, Apple is uh, taking our business away here. They're, uh, they're using our platform to make money. So that's not right. I mean, they're taking the privacy of people in any phone and using it for Facebook's benefit and Apple and Google said, no, only we have a right to take your privacy. Only we have a right to, to make money because it's our platform. Now there's a big danger in that, which I'll talk about in a different video because they're not doing it for your, for they're not doing it for you, Apple and Google. They're not protecting you from Facebook's privacy invasion or a semantic or any of that. They're not doing it for you. They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it for themselves. So yes, there, there's a problem here. There's a problem with how, how uh, Apple and Google can control things. And it's connected to a lot of things that, you know, I, I'll mention this because it'll come up in a future video, maybe in a couple of weeks. Uh, things like uh, safe browsing, uh, uh, 
safety net is some of the terms they're using here, which are, are filtering tools to basically filter everything you type into to the, to the uh, address bar or search engine. These are all being filtered. And the, the rule is that they're being filtered because they want to stop the bad guys and the bad entities from doing things to you. Things like browser fingerprinting, we're going to stop that. Yeah, uh, they stop it from, for, they stop other advertisers they're going to be stopping. They haven't stopped it yet. They will be stopping advertisers at some point from doing browser fingerprinting. So that way then, you know, they get less information from you, but that's not really the whole story. They, they're just consolidating it so that these advertisers have to pay Google for that information. Same with Apple, advertising ID, pay Apple for that. For that. So this is not, you know, it's, some of you think this is, these are privacy moves and they're not. They're not privacy moves. They're, they're, they're all, you know, hidden moves uh, because they have their own agenda. Their agenda is not your agenda. What, what is good for Apple and Google is not necessarily because it's good for you. It's what is good for them. And we're, we're and this consolidation of big tech here may have some cross benefits in the in in the sense that certain companies like the ad companies losing losing the ability to track us uh, through through browsers uh, through Facebook losing the ability to track us to um, to um, um, and 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 in and, and, and semant uh, companies like Semantic being able to to do sneaky things like like play around with uh, with certificates. Yeah, they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, and you think it's because it's, it's something good that Apple and Google are doing. And not really. Like when you're talking about the iCloud private relay, they're basically funneling the traffic of every single user of an iPhone into Apple. If you're using, if you're using an iOS device, all of your internet traffic has to go to Apple first. It, it, you don't even realize the consequence of that. All traffic has to go to Apple first, meaning if they want to block something, they can block it at Apple and your it, the website's going to disappear. They can make any website disappear. These, these are things that we're going to talk about in more detail later on. We're going to talk about this in more detail later on, but uh, again, uh, at least the, the, the only thing I'm focusing on today is the fact that the value of what they're doing is big tech against big tech. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's good that they're shake, shaking each other up. That's it's fine with me. They can shake each other up right now. And then later on, uh, we need to prepare for step two here. Step two is when they actually use this to control the information. So <clears throat> just, just be aware of that. Anyway, that's uh, that's my rant for today, and um, I, and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that Zuck is suffering. Very glad. If you have stock in Facebook, uh, unload. Time to unload. Maybe too late now. You probably lost a lot of money already. But <clears throat> yep, could have told you that. Yes, you you can unload your Facebook stock. So. Anyway, thank you for this segment here, and I will uh, continue on with the next segment after a brief interruption here, which is to talk about my sponsor. So my sponsor is Linode. So Linode has been my sponsor for a couple of years now. In fact, uh, I rarely have sponsors, and Linode has been a continuous sponsor because they're a good company. Linode has been purchased by Akamai. No change. They're still do exactly the same thing as they have been doing before. Support still the same, everything still the same. And um, uh, it's if you're looking for value in cloud services, like if you want to set up your own WordPress server, if you want to set up your own uh, website without a WordPress server, or run some of the other utilities that you can run on Linux, or if you want to even just learn how to do Linux and do it on a server, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, maybe I can try it using Amazon AWS, or maybe I can try using um, GoDaddy or one of these. And you will find that when you go to these places, that for, first of all, support is awful. 
AWS is, you know, non-existent support. It's really, you know, you got to figure everything out by yourself. Linode is a lot easier to use. Support is always available and very, very uh, uh, responsive and very, very friendly. And uh, uh, and with with high level personnel responding to you all the time, I really highly highly recommend Linode. And the price is right. The price is right. And by the way, if you uh, if you go to Linode and sign up with a new account and use the code Rob Braxman as shown in the thing there, if you type the code uh, Linode.com/slash/Rob Braxman, they'll give you a two hundred dollar credit. <clears throat> And then you can play. Uh, you can play with servers, uh, big or small, uh, and some of their servers are pretty cheap. It's like five dollars a month, and that's if you use it for the whole month. If you use it, you know, a day here, a day there, you're not even going to get the five dollars. For for so for young people who want to learn to uh, to do uh, you know server management, it's it's a place to start. You can you know budget uh, five dollars a month, and that's probably too much. So yeah, it's it's a good way to learn. And then you can set up some real servers and get some real clients. So anyway, that's uh, that's the story on Linode. And we will continue now with um, some other topics. I'm like looking at your comments here. By the way, I just got my Starlink. Somebody would. So a lot of people are asking me, uh, what what does the Starlink work? The Starlink not work? Well, I got my Starlink. So, yeah, I got my Starlink, tried it out, and uh, initial impressions when I plugged it in, actually pretty easy. There wasn't much to do. Uh, there wasn't even any instructions. It just just made sense to do to 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 uh, figure it out, and I was able to figure it out without any instructions, and uh, even without an app. I didn't. I didn't even use any app to set it up initially, but you need an app to, to control it. But once you once you've done that, then you can manipulate it. Because I did not know this that by default Starlink only operates in 2.4 gigahertz. So so I was checking the traffic and I said this is kind of slow. Maximum was you know 30 40 uh, megabits per second. Well, that's that's not very fast. So and so and I looked at it and I said oh. It's 2.4 gigahertz. It's only running in N mode, 802.11n, which is maximum of 30 some, like 35 megabits per second is the maximum on that, on that uh, 2.4 gigahertz mode. So I was able to verify, yes, in, in, uh, here in Los Angeles in my area, uh, the, the throughput before it gets to the router this is satellite to to Starlink was around 89 megabits per second, which is not bad if I get that to consistently work. Okay, so it's 89 megabits per second. So I'll tell you what happens in a in the future. I'm uh, I'm uh, you know I'm only I'm only telling you my initial impressions here. I bought it to test. I, I want to see if it's steady enough. Can you put a router on it? The, the other thing that I found, which is kind of interesting with the, with the Starlink, is that it's using dynamic IP addresses. The IP addresses are not sticking. They're changing. So the IP addresses are changing. So as I saw it, the IP addresses are IPv6. Okay? Now, let me just explain what that means because I explained in the, in the last video with carriers. So that means it's behaving like mobile, which means it's going to IPv6 to the satellite and then it gets, uh, it gets uh, consolidated or aggregated into a router that's going to route, route the traffic in IPv4. What that means is, in theory, you don't need a VPN for an external party because the external party can't it, it, behaving like a data plan on cell so that's what I discovered that's what I discovered it's behaving like a data plan on cell where the uh, the traffic uh, the IP address is not fixed to you not like your 
if you're using a, a cable modem, the IP address is pretty much fixed. And so it identifies you completely. Here, uh, it's IPv6. Which, and just to translate this for you, in case you don't understand what this means, if it's IPv6 on, on the uh, satellite side, it means that they have to route it to a IPv4 router downstream somewhere and they have to aggregate the traffic into the IPv6, I mean IPv4 router, meaning a lot of people will be using the same router. So that would be functioning kind of like a VPN in the sense that your IP address doesn't point to you. Uh, that's what I discovered. So that's uh, something that uh, might be of interest. So it does not behave like a home router. Home router is very, very uh, identifiable because the IPv4 address of your home router is known to the outside world and everyone can spot it. So that's a plus. It's, it's definitely a plus. So beyond that, I don't have any uh, you know new experience here. It's only, I've only run it for a few hours. No, the Starlink is, is at my house. I am not connected to Starlink right now. And uh, the reason is on the other side of the house and I can't get the signal that far. So otherwise I would have tested to see if I could broadcast uh, using the Starlink. So I'm not on Starlink right now. So again, I just bought it to test. It's kind of expensive. The hardware was like 800 and some dollars and then uh, the, the service is expensive. It's 100, 110, 120 bucks a month. Something like that. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. So it's it, it is expensive. <clears throat> so may not be worth it. I don't know. I mean, it may be worth it only when you don't have a choice. But you know, for me, I, you know, it's it's okay to have a testing ability here with a different different uh, ISP. So I'm not tied to one because I'm tied to the cable company, and you know, it's night nice seven option. So, because of what I do. So, anyway, that's uh, that's uh, the Starlink story. So, I got that from your comments. So, some some of you were talking about Starlink. Is Starlink private and secure? Or does it track you too? Uh, Starlink can track you, like a carrier can track you. So, it's it's basically the same. But understand that, like a carrier, the limitation is that your traffic is TLS encrypted. So because of that, there isn't really much to track other than the fact that they can track your the IP addresses, you know, of the parties talking. So in theory, they can find out what websites you visit, in theory. Uh, but that's about it. They can't read the traffic. Uh, it's, it's basically like the carrier side. It's like using a data plan on a phone. And I told you that's actually not too bad because most of the spying on, on, a, on, most of the spying on your cell is on the PSTN or public switch telephone network side or the SS7 channel of the transmission, which is texting and voice. The, the, the spying on the data side is very limited. This is about the same. Okay, so this is about the same. The spying on the data side is limited. I tried doing a VPN on it, and it is very slow. So I was running a VPN through the uh, satellite, and it was super slow. Reason may be related to the, uh, the packet size. It's called MTU units. The MTU that is defaulted on the VPN may not be suitable for the satellite. So at this moment, it, the, using the VPN over Starlink is very, very slow. So <clears throat> something to research. I don't really know the answer yet. I just got this. So this is kind of early stage. Okay. So um, anyway, that's... Uh, why, why do you want to talk about this lore guy? You know, they're, they're all a bunch of... Yeah. 
<clears throat> Bunch of kids that don't really know anything. Bunch of kids that don't really know anything. I want to talk to you, and sorry if you take this badly here, but I, I don't think I've ever really talked about my products. Because, you know, I have a VPN, I have um, the Brax Mail, and then I have the Brax Phone. Well, I talk about the phone a lot, but I don't actually think I've actually talked about why it's uh, what 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 am I offering with some of these products that's supposed to help your privacy? Why am I even doing this? So let me start with the email side. <clears throat> let me start with the email side. So I don't want to sell you a false promise. The false promise that is given to you by Proton Mail and Tutanora and some of these companies, and they're they're promising you encryption. They're promising you encryption. Well, the reality is email has no encryption. The only time encryption is active on a proton mail is if you're talking proton mail to proton mail. In that very limited instance. The problem is all of, if you use proton mail as your main account, all of your email is going to proton mail. 99% of which or more, 99.5% of it or 99.9% .9 of it will not be encrypted. So it's only encrypted to somebody else with Proton Mail. So therefore, a Proton Mail could then read all of your mail and hear you are on Proton Mail supposedly because you're trying to protect your privacy. And the reality is how do you do that when you know email is not encrypted to begin with for regular use? So what is the promise? It's a fake promise. All you did was put a big target on your face and said, "Hey, I'm I'm hiding. Here I am. Here, here I am on uh, on Proton Mail. I'm hiding, but you know my my email address is protonmail.com. And well, I love I love all these other OSs like uh, you know the one that start with a G. You know that that the Google OS and oh I love iPhones too that that group and I, I'm gonna use Proton Mail. Yeah, turn yourself into a talking target with no real benefit uh, because what's the benefit when, you know, is there's no real encryption. So that's a false expectation. That is not really the main problem of the email. The problem with emails is, you know, it's much more basic. The problem with email is connecting emails to each other using uh, contact lists and being able to... Uh, to read the metadata. So the two parts to, to the email problem is the metadata. And what is the metadata? Well, every time you do a send, every time you do an email send to a normal party, you know, in unencrypted, the 99.9% .9 of your email that is not encrypted, for most of us, it's 100% of the email that's not encrypted. Anyone can read the content, but what is you're not knowing is that you're sending your metadata with every sent email. So what does that mean? Well, your IP address is on there. Uh, often the machine name is also on there. So sometimes some people are sending sending a uh, email and the machine name is on there revealing your real name because some of you put your real name in the machine name on your computer on Windows or a Mac. So you're, you're actually identifying your device by name and then you're sending this with your email while you're using some, you know, some uh, the privacy guy at protonmail.com, and yet you know you're sending you're sending your machine name. Okay, so that's something that Brax takes care of because it strips away the header, so that there's no information on the header. There's no information about your IP address or what server you're connecting to, and any of that. It doesn't have any of that information. So that is stripped out of the email header. The next thing that it does, it gives you five domains. Now, the reason for the five domains is so you can separate your email use. For two-factor authentication, you can use one, one domain. This all, goes to the, this all goes to the same inbox, so you don't even have to worry about managing it. There are just five domains, automatically active. Uh, you can use braxmail.net, email1.me, bytes.me, uh, bytes what, uh, what is it? Uh, 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 Brax at Live, 
There's, and there, there's five of them. <clears throat> and you can use them for different purposes and they all go to the same inbox, but to the party that's tracking you, they're not making the connection between, let's say, uh, uh, your old email on Gmail versus this, you know, new email from, from me, which is, let's say, Braxad Live. And they're not making that connection, which means that it's disconnected in the, uh, in the records of that big tech platform for spying. So that is why, you know, that is, those are the real advantages that, that I'm offering with, with the email and not some of these fake promises that don't really mean anything. And you just, it's psychologically, you think it's helping you, but it's not. It, it, it just puts you into a mode where you think you should be trusting your email more. And I'm not saying that. You, you don't ever trust your email. Try to, to elim, el, uh, limit what actually goes on in email. But, you know, you need email still. So use it, use it in the way it's intended, which is for, for unimportant things. If it's important, move on to a secure platform. Move on to an app. Move on to a secure app away from, from using email. So don't come to me and say, my email is very important. I'm getting all the secret information on email. Well, if you're using it like that, then you're using it incorrectly. <clears throat> because everyone's reading that. You can't hide the content of your email because anyone can read that. So all we have to do is obfuscate the identity of the email so at least even if they read it, they don't know who it is. That's all I'm trying to do here. Take away the metadata, use different domains for different purposes so that they don't interconnect. That's all I'm saying, and that's really the benefit. Anyway, that has to do with email. The next issue is, is, uh, is you know, I offer a service for, for VPNs, it's Bytes VPN. And people are like saying, oh, what about Nord VPN? What about private internet access and, you know, Express VPN and I, you know, it's like, uh, is, are they all good? I, you know, and you see all the advertisers in, in all the different videos and, and, uh, and because they're big players, they, you know, 90% of their money is probably invested in marketing. Uh, yeah, so they can do that. They don't even have to make much per, per uh, user because they're, they're doing it by repeat, uh, repeat subscriptions uh, and volume. They're just doing it by volume. Well, the problem with the volume, guys, <clears throat> when you have a lot of you on the same VPN, like, in, you know, in the case of the big ones, the big player, like the Nords and the private internet access express VPNs, is that uh, the big tech platforms like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, they actually know who's on the VPN and they actually even know which VPN. And the reason is there's so many of you. There's so many of you sharing the same IP address. Too many. So in a sense, then you're, you're, uh, you're pretty much automatically exposed because actually there's an algorithm in Amazon, for example, to spot if people are doing uh, shady things with their Amazon Associates account. It's actually in the terms of service that they, they, they spot things like that where, you know, they track the IP address of people doing, uh, you know, um, Amazon Associates and making themselves look like different people. And they understand that some of you will use a VPN to hide your activities. And then they say, well, you know, we're, I'm, we're using a VPN, except they know you're using the VPN. <clears throat> Do you know which VPN? Uh, that's the problem of, of the, being with a large player like that is it becomes too obvious becomes too obvious so um, this is where bytes vpn stands out first of all we we have a lot of servers for really not that many subscribers so i'm not i'm not uh, you know I, i'm not doing any kind of serious marketing i'm not interested in a lot of volume um and so there's not that excessive traffic and excessive number of people with the same IP address per server. So it's, it's very moderate. And because of that, it doesn't really stand out. And in, in, in fact, it's pretty hard to tell that it's a VPN. Uh, some of them just make a guess because, you know, they check the, the IP address and say it belongs to an ISP. Therefore, it must be a VPN. But other than that, they don't actually know. 
there's no actual way to find out if it's actually a VPN. It could just be a virtual private network. I mean, a, not a virtual private, a virtual VPC. So, uh, uh, meaning an intentional network, like, you know, in a corporate environment. Uh, so and that's the advantage of Byte VPN. It's, it's, it's kind of like stealthy like that. Like you don't really know. Uh, because of that, my servers are not overloaded because, you know, there's not, uh, there's not an excessive number. We have so many servers and because of the number of people versus the server is very low. It's more costly for me, but it's better service for you. So that's, that's one of the benefits. The, the second thing that we do with, uh, with Byte VPN is, uh, is we do not do the kind of tricks that some of these irritating providers do. Like I used to be, before I started the VPN, I was on private internet access PIA. And they start started blocking ports. They stopped, started blocking uh, SMTP, for example. So you have email and your email doesn't work because they block SMTP. Now, it, it, this is kind of connected to what I said before. Why, why do you think uh, PIA and Nord and all these companies, what do they block? Why do they block SMTP? That's because the VPN has attracted scammers. So the big VPNs are full of scammers. So that's why they're such a target because people, they, they almost consider like Tor now. You, you're on a big VPN and the people, the uh, websites are saying, hey, you're on a, v, you're on a, one of these big VPNs. We see all the duplicate IP addresses, high number of, of duplicate IP addresses, which, which tells us that you are, you are a, uh, on one of these major VPNs. And th these VPNs are filled with scammers. They're the one doing the, the spam mail. And that's why they're blocking the SMTP because it just attracts the wrong kind of people. Well, Bytes VPN does not have that kind of crowd because they're all from people here on my channel from YouTube and so on. So privacy uh, interested people. And I'm going to tell you that, yeah, my service is not the cheapest. I mean, come on. It's like uh, you're going to save 10 bucks a year. Is, is that really worth uh, even discussing? I mean, it's not, it's not worth it, but uh, to even argue about when when the advantage is that you don't get corralled into the same group and be identified as uh, being part of you know a, a scamming crowd that's very common on VPNs nowadays. So almost anyone that needs to do spamming or you know any kind of evil uh, would use a VPN, and you know that's why the VPNs are getting blocked because of it. So Byte Byte VPN doesn't have that problem. The worst problem we have is some of you persist in downloading movies illegally. That's the biggest problem. So, uh, 90 per year is a great deal. Oh, I thought you meant <laughs> it's like a bad deal. Uh, can you, can they still find you in a dead zone? What does that mean? Does your phone come with DuckDuckGo? Uh, not anymore. The, uh, the phone is shipped with Brave now, and on the on the upgrades, it's, it's uh, Brave. Okay, so the other thing that we have, which is kind of unique, is we have, of course, the uh, the Brax Two phone, and and uh, you know, I'm really I'm really proud of this phone. By the way, this comes with a custom case made by somebody on Braxme. So this is a uh, this is not the original case. So if you want a case like this, this guy is 3D printing this case. It's kind of a hard case and it has more protection and uh, and he's selling this. Uh, you can contact him and he sells it on eBay. Uh, so th that's an option that's available. But anyway, that's, that's kind of nice because the phone is custom. There really isn't any existing you know models that uh, of cases for it other than the case that we give to you because you buy it it comes with a case but it's not a hard case kind of a softer case it's a, it's an attractive case but it's not a hard case so anyway the the we have a new model coming out uh, sometime keeps getting delayed sorry but sometime in october we're gonna have the uh, a different model 
it's almost the same. The only difference is we, we added band four. So that affects such a small number of people, but the, the, uh, the, the rest of it is exactly the same phone. It's gonna have the same exact OS. Brax OS is a very sophisticated OS. It's, it's uh, you know, definitely, definitely, you know, not, not a joke OS. In some, some of you may think that we just cobbled that together and copied Lineage OS or something. It's not, it's actually, it's actually uh, uh, made independently uh, with people in the same background as some of those other names you're very familiar with. And uh, the community, yeah, they all know each other, the people in the, the OS business. So, so Brax OS has, has, a very, has some very sophisticated roots. And some of you may not know this, so I'll, I'll uh, kind of like drop, drop this uh, little hint with you. But uh, back in the day, back in the day, uh, this phone, I think the, the model before this, this is version two. The, the first version of this used to be sold as a black phone. Some of you are familiar with black phones. So, oh yeah, very super secure. Uh, version one of this used to be black phone. <clears throat> so in case you're asking, you know, uh, what what is the uh, sophistication level of of Brax OS? Well, yeah, if you know the roots are the roots are there, so it's uh, some pretty good roots. Now, uh, <clears throat> as you know, the the main problem that we've encountered being you know a manufacturer of a model that's not well known is that the the carriers have been blocking this phone. And the reason that they've been blocking the phone in the past is because the phone was flashed at the factory with the IMEI of a BlackBerry Z10. So this phone appears to the carrier as a BlackBerry Z10. And because that's a 3G phone, then they blacklisted it in just about every carrier now. So it wasn't as blacklisted at the beginning, but more and more it's... Uh, getting getting pretty global so so the number of cases where the phone wasn't running with the carrier uh was multiplying it used to be just two percent of the cases didn't work with brax phone and it became higher and we solved that because now we pre-flash the imei of the phone to be something else very successful it works all the time it'll be in the next video so, yeah, it's very successful. The phone has no problem. It works. No, no carrier bands in now. So, works flawlessly. So I'm very proud of that. So that's even on the current version. So the current version, we basically we flash the phone before we ship it. So, so we're flashing all our stock to not be a BlackBerry Z10, and that seems to solve the issue. Uh, because the phone is actually pretty nice, and and surprisingly, the 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 percentage of of people who really like the phone versus let's say Google Pixel is very high. I'm actually uh, I'm I'm very pleased with that. I mean the the perception of people is like, hey, this is better, and it is for for one thing. You can reset the phone. There's there's many things you can do here that you can't do on a Lineage OS on a Pixel or running some of the other OSs like you know even Calyx. Uh, for example, we handle, we handle supple on this. You know, the supple spine? That's handled on Brax too. Not really handled well with some of these other, other ones. Uh, apparently even Calyx doesn't really handle supple. They know about it, but they don't know what to do. So, yeah. So fortunately we know what to do, so I don't need to discuss our way because I don't need to teach them. But, uh, Happy to say that you know we're we're solving the supple problem with the Brax two, where it tracks location using supple. Uh, there's no Wi-Fi triangulation with the phone. Uh, there's no Wi-Fi triangulation indoors. In fact, I tried it. Uh, I was using Starlink, and Starlink was going to find obstructions, and it can't get the location fixed. So, 
couldn't get a location fix because there's no Wi-Fi triangulation indoors. So, yeah. So, anyway, uh, um, the uh, next video we'll talk about the IMEI because this is kind of an unusual situation here because you can flash the IMEI of a Brax2 phone. How many phones can you flash the IMEI to? So, uh, do you understand what that means? If you can flash the IMEI all day, you can actually make it appear like a different phone every day if you are interested in doing that. You can do that on a Brax2 phone. You can't do that on a Pixel. So it's kind of an advantage. It's a hardware advantage as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's one of these things that just bug me uh, the most. And that's the, uh, the idea of IMEI tracking. And the fact that we can blow that away as an issue is, is kind of a nice side benefit. So that's a nice feature of Brax2 that, uh, that I'd like to share. So anyway, we, uh, we are uh, uh, also coming up with an update to uh, the Brax OS shortly. There's something that I wanted to talk about, but I can't yet. And I, I wanted to uh, talk about the uh, open source part of uh, Brax OS and doing all that. And uh, that's being set up right now. And uh, it, it's going to be very interesting when it gets gets done. And uh, in theory, then other people can take some of the roots of, uh, you know, what Brax OS is based on and use it on some other phone. So that, that, may, that may come as well. So that's, that's uh, hopefully what will happen will be a community community effort. So at the moment, um, it's not yet done. So just wait a moment. It's, you know, it, it is a lot of legwork to do all this. And, uh, you know, publishing in open source and then changing the code it's not helpful if you're still in the middle of changing things. So the change has to happen first so we don't have to go back and forth and keep repeating. So, but that's, that's going to happen uh, shortly. I was hoping, you know, that it would have been done by now. So it's not. So maybe in, let's, let's see what happens in 30 days. So, you know, I'm, I'm, at least that's a target. Okay. That's a target that I'm shooting for is that we, uh, we uh, move on to uh, a different level of transparency with Brax OS, and I would be very happy to, to share that with you and share some of the uh, organization behind, uh, you know, the makings of a Brax OS, and because you know, just it just opens up opens it up to, uh, I mean, answers the questions that you probably want to have answered about what's in it. And there's no real mystery to it, but it's not based on any other OS. So, and that's the good news. It's not based on, it's, it is not based on lineage or anything like that. And like I said, the, uh, uh, the, the, the last black phone model was the model before this. So, in case you didn't know. And some some of some of the variants of this are being used by you know certain organizations like uh, law enforcement and so on. So they're using it as a secure phone in various environments. Some some variant of it, but not Brax OS, but the same phone model using a variant of the yeah Bra of the Brax OS. So it's not it's not Brax OS is a more open. Open OS, it's more consumer focused, so it's not meant to lock it down too much. Where some of the other variants I'm talking about are very locked down versions. So I just want you to, you know, to know that the intent is not to lock it down. We don't intend to, to be going in the direction of some of these other OSs, like the one that starts with a G, uh, where they are so restrictive that it's not really a good experience for the average consumer to use. That is not the experience we want. We, we want the phone to be known as a phone with no identity, 
but we don't have to go into the extreme here because once you've taken out the identity on the phone, really none of it matters. Somebody can be tracking you with trackers all day and if they don't know who they're tracking, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, if you understand, you know, a standard phone, let's say you have a Google Android, that's a normie phone or an Apple iPhone, you have your Apple ID, everything you do on the phone, every all the stuff that Apple does, tracking location, all that is always attached to your Apple ID, the serial number of the device and all that. Well, on, on uh, Google Android, it has your Google ID and then they track you using 2FA, 2FA means using the Google app, which can then be the IMEI and MZ and all that on the phone. There is no Google on this phone. <clears throat> there is no Apple on this phone. So there, there's no sign in, there's no, you don't ever log into any of that. So the phone does not have an identity. It just appears like a blank box. And, uh, you know, and it, it, there really isn't a solution, a usable solution uh, that even compares to this. Here you can have a little bit of peace of, not a lot of, a lot of bit, a lot of peace of mind. Here you have peace of mind because you have an environment where you, you don't have to worry about what you're doing on the phone because no one can track it. There's no information on the phone about who owns it. There's, it, it in fact, even if you get what is called a user agent, which is to define what the phone is, the phone doesn't even say much of what it is. And there's no identity that attaches to the phone. And I told you that the data side of things doesn't really have an IP address that can even be tracked. And MAC addresses on these are are uh, are uh, randomized, so they even have randomized MAC addresses. So, so basically, the phone is unknown. It's an unknown entity. It's an unknown presence, and there really is no equivalent to it. So a lot of you just don't care, and you just go around with your you know Apple fourteen Pro because you're so excited to get one, and. Uh, I don't know why I would be excited to get spied on even with my phone being off. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Where I never have to worry about anyone knowing location or anything from this phone. In fact, uh, Wi-Fi triangulation doesn't even work indoors. And the supple doesn't, you know, generate some data for, for Google. So, yeah, if, you know, it's this is this is all good news. And I'm not sure what the option is. If some, some of you are like, thinking there's some other option. Well, you know, I'm seeing this is like the best option at the moment. I mean, from, from a privacy point of view, I mean, I'm using this. Uh, I was using Lineage OS for a while, but because of the supple problem, uh, that's not solved on, on uh, that is not solved on Lineage OS. So that's kind of a, kind of an issue. There is no supple problem on a Brax 2. In case you don't know what supple is, you got to watch the video from last week. Very important video. Very, very important video. What supple is and all the spying that occurs uh, on a phone with NLPs and supple and all these technical terms, which just means that you got to worry about it and you don't have to worry about it on this kind of phone. So the key is no identity. Doesn't connect to anything. Even if you log into an app, let's say you logged into Spotify, right? And then on a different uh, app, you log into Amazon. So let's say you're running Spotify and Amazon. Amazon cannot see Spotify on this phone. Spotify cannot see Amazon on this phone. They don't really have any cross identity. That's not possible with the way this is designed. Because there's no Google ID, there's no commonality. There's really nothing that connects those two apps and say, oh yeah, we, we know that you're using uh, Spotify and Amazon. It does, there's no, no, there's nothing that tracks even that. There's no telemetry. Whereas on a Google phone, that information is sent. In fact, Google knows how many times you open the Spotify app, when you're using the Spotify, Apple too, and when you use the Amazon app and how much, how long you, you've been using it. They, they know all that cross, flat, cross app. Worse than this, there's none. So if you're really concerned about privacy, 90% of the battle of privacy is on the phone right now, which is why I focus on it. 
90% of privacy issue is on the phone. So 90% that's pretty big. That's pretty big. I mean if you uh, if you uh, can compare it to computer, the computer is probably 10% of the risk right now. 90% of the risk is the phone. So, but l I imagine they could still lower tower triangulate me, uh, not on a Brax2 phone because tower triangulation does not exist. So there's no NLP. Do you understand? If you, you have to watch the video. To, in order to triangulate you, uh, on a regular phone, you have to dial 911. Otherwise, it only goes through Supple. Uh, and if Supple is, is, uh, is cut off, as we do, then how are you going to be tracked? NLP side, but there's no NLP here by default. Or it's called Network Location Provider. It doesn't connect to one. It's disabled. Which is why location it can not always work indoors. It remembers your last location outdoors, but not indoors. That uses tower triangulation and Wi-Fi triangulation, which doesn't exist. So, yeah, lovely. I mean, lovely solution. I mean, the, the fact that it's pretty much a brainless solution because you don't have to think about it. You, you get the phone and you don't have to worry about what apps can I use, what apps can I not use, what do I not do? You don't have to think about any of that because it, it doesn't matter. The phone doesn't reveal an identity. The phone doesn't reveal a location uh, uh, unless you, you turn it on with permissions outdoors or unless you dial 911, in which case it will triangulate you. Okay? So you can you can uh, get trang in an emergency and you dial nine one one, it will tower triangulate and send it to the carrier. So, but only at that moment. So, uh, without an NLP, assuming you have a network connection, is it okay to put e put e we link on the Brax two e we link uses email to log in. Uh, Braxton doesn't require any email anyway, so I don't know what your question is. <clears throat> the the Braxton email is to be able to recover your password. If you don't put a uh, a verified email, then you can't you can't if you ever lost your password, then you're zucked. Got to create a new account. Okay, that's. The worst worst case scenario. Can I get that dynamic island on the Rex two phone? Hell no. No ducking dynamic island. No. This uh, uh does the Brax phone work in Australia? Well, if it doesn't, then uh, the many Brax phones I've shipped to Australia should be coming back. Yes, the Brax phone works in Australia because I've shipped many to Australia. The phone is configured for international use, so it it works. Uh, internationally uh, as far as I'm aware there's no there's no there's no issue uh, it the, the problems with the phone being blocked is in the US it's, it's a US issue so I don't know if you know what countries are are copying the US on this at the moment it's you know it's mostly US so we can beat that now because we've the ones we ship to you now have a different IMEI, so we've solved that issue. Does the Brax phone still use T-Mobile? No, it can use any, any. Um, little iffy on Verizon. Verizon, maybe I'm going to say eighty percent of Verizon might work. There's a twenty percent that might not, because of bad four. So. In which case, then, you know, we have a band four version coming out. List the bands and they can check their carrier. The, the bands are in the uh, in the uh, store description of the phone. It's, it's on there. So uh, does the law require you to have a GPS chip in the phone, phones you produce? The GPS chip is in the motherboard. You cannot take it off. It's a motherboard thing. So... so let me just explain this because some of you don't know this. 
because so, some of somebody actually said to me, "Is your phone made in China?" Because otherwise, then I won't buy it because it's made in China. And it's like, well, then don't, don't buy any other phone because they're all made in China. So you know, where do you think iPhones are made? Where do you think Google Pixels are made? I mean, you know, just about every major brand is made in China. But that's not actually accurate. Because let, let me let me explain a little bit better. Actually, the motherboards are not made in China. At least China mainland. So the there are. Th as far as I know, three motherboard makers for phones. So a motherboard is, the, you know, the, the main circuit board in the phone. It, they assemble it in China, but they have to buy the motherboard from someone. And because of patent reasons, the motherboards only come from a few places. So the sellers of the motherboards are Qualcomm USA. So actually, you know, most of the phones in the USA have motherboards from the USA made by Qualcomm. The second popular model used uh, in uh, in the USA, as far as motherboards go, so Qualcomm is like Snapdragon, so a Snapdragon motherboard. So a lot of you know famous brands all use Snapdragon. Any, anything from Pixels to uh, to Motorola's to you know to uh, uh, Samsung's use Snapdragon, which is Qualcomm. Okay, then the next brand. The next motherboard is Samsung. Samsung uh, has its own motherboard, plus it uses Qualcomm motherboard. So the uh, uh, X, what is it? Exos, X, is it Exos? X something. Exo something. Anyway, that is the, the uh, Samsung motherboard. Too many acronyms, so it's really hard to remember exactly, but Exo something is the uh, motherboard by Samsung, made by Samsung, so Korea. The, the majority of phones actually are made by MediaTek. MediaTek makes, you know, just about every other Chinese brand of phones. I'm sure it makes all the Huawei phones and Brax2 phones, uh, OnePlus, uh, on and on and on. They, they're, they're, you know, uh, tons of Motorola's, Lenovo's, this, that. Uh, okay. So anyway, the the phone from uh, the phone from uh, MediaTek. I mean, the motherboard is made by MediaTek. So those are the three major players. China does not make a motherboard. They assemble. So they make all the other parts. You know, like the screen, the uh, camera, you know, all the, the various accessories, the case, they manufacture that in China. Uh, the plastic parts, the, the light, you know, all that. The motherboard is not. The motherboard, which is where all the circuitry is. And the baseband modem, the biggest spy portion of the phone, this baseband modem, is also made only by those three uh, phone makers. And this is interesting. The patents are owned only by two. So it's really just Qualcomm and MediaTek. So Samsung, if they need to use a Qualcomm chip, gets the chips from Qualcomm. So a Samsung motherboard uses Qualcomm chips. So in case you didn't understand all this, it's still pretty much integrated into just two manufacturers, MediaTek in Taiwan and uh, Qualcomm in the U.S. So whether we like it or not, you know, it's consolidated in these, within these two players. So, so China's entry into the, the phone innards, so to speak, are really left to just the other components that doesn't have to do with the, has nothing to do with the integrated circuitry inside. <clears throat> so they still have to buy that from external sources. So hopefully that kind of, uh, you know, uh, needs to that information needs to be spread because the, the 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 sense that all phones are made in China, which it is, assembled. But if you look at individual components, it's not really it's not really China. So some you know some people are justifying it. We need to build a phone in the U.S. and build every little part of this. You know all the the camera and all the you know whatever. What, whatever little part you need 
on the phone and build it in the US, uh, and you'll find it's actually very little security benefit because the dangerous parts of the phone are actually built by Qualcomm and MediaTek, and I will assure you there are dangerous things put in there by Qualcomm and MediaTek, like the dangerous things in the baseband modem. All the different spy elements of the phone are built into the baseband modem. <clears throat> so just want to make sure that is clear because that often is not is not clear. Okay, okay. So what uh, what am I missing there from the question point of view? Will there be a well? There will be a Brax three, Brax four, Brax whatever, as time goes by. So we're still we still you know I just ordered a large stock of this for uh, the Brax two with Bad four. So we will we will have this model uh, probably for, at least through uh, you know through uh, maybe t till next summer. And that may be when the next model comes out. Okay, so what am I missing here? Uh, did Exynos, yes, that's it, Exynos, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to, I'm saying, I make videos about it and then, you know, I forget what the actual term was. Like, you know, very sign I've been talking about. The, the reason I don't even remember the names of these is for years, because they were, you know, I, I received threats from, from when I started talking about semantic and blue code systems and and LifeLog and VeriSign, I was getting threats. And, uh, you know, apparently uh, I was causing damage to their uh, reputation and they were threatening me in some way, in a hidden way. And, uh, and uh, so for that reason, I, I never referred to them by real name. I referred to uh, the, the VeriSign as the, what is it, the, the true signing company, the LifeLock as the uh, LoveLock, Blue Code Systems as the Blue, blue Suit People. So I was using like these, act, these little terms so I don't want to mention the, the names. Well, none of those names are matter now because they've all been sold to somebody else. So anything I've said in the past doesn't apply anymore because they're all owned by different people. So anyway, that's, uh, that's why I can use their names now, except I forgot, forgot what the name is. Okay, the, if you want a scam, the, one of the biggest scams, by the way, is uh, Nor Nor Norton Norton Antivirus. You, you can watch my video on antivirus. I, I would never waste my money on that. And they, what, once they get you an, on a Norton, they don't. They, they secretly charge you every year, even if you're not using it. I have to dispute Norton every year because I signed up with them. I don't know, ten years ago, and they're still building me every year. It's a, it's like a scammy company. This is why I don't do auto renewal because I don't want to scam you. I don't want to scam you with auto renewal. So yeah, I know it. It, it makes it more difficult because you gotta go remember to renew your subscription, and I'm sure I lose a few. I use I lose a lot of subscriptions every year because I don't auto renew. But you know what? It's okay then because I'm not a scammer. So I'm not gonna go scam you. You you uh, buy it when you need it. If you don't want it, you don't have to pay for it. If you haven't used it, then obviously you don't care. So I'm not going to go out to charge you if you're not going to use it. So we, we only care if you if you if you use it. So uh, yeah, I, I don't do a lot of these tricks. I don't collect your email for uh, for spamming you about you know reminding you about your email subscription with a VPN because many of you do not have an email on Braxme. I would say, you know. 70% of you have no email on Braxme, so I can't, I can't uh, even send you a reminder that your, your uh, subscription is expiring unless you go to Braxme, because I can't, it just, it's just my way. I'm trying to respect your privacy here. What VPN do I recommend? Oh my gosh. That's, <laughs> that's very funny, very funny. 
So look at the description. I'm not going to go repeat talking about that. So um, I, I am not a truth, truth social Kathy. Kathy, my good friend Kathy. No, I am not on Truth so Social. I am on Rumble. I'm on Odyssey. And I'm on Braxme. And I'm on YouTube. That's it. I don't even go to my Twitter account. I haven't used Twitter in years. Okay, I am not active on Twitter. I have a Twitter account. It's still there. I don't go to it. I don't know what's on it. I haven't checked. So, yeah. So I am not, I am not on Truth Social. But I am on Rumble. Now, uh, Rumble didn't promote this uh, uh, broadcast this time around. There's, there, it, it's it's kind of hard to... They have to, to, you know, specifically choose to promote it. And if I don't get in touch with them in sufficient time, then they don't. So, yeah, uh, which is kind of like iffy. The last time they promoted it, I got like a thousand people live at any one time. So there were several thousand people watching the live last week. I thought you booted off of Twitter. You got booted off. No, I'm still on Twitter. It's, the account's still there. I just haven't logged in. I haven't logged into Twitter. So as you all know, Twitter's kind of toxic. And I'm, you know, I'm just looking at was it benefiting me? And, and I noticed I wasn't getting any benefits from being on Twitter. If it doesn't benefit me, then I'm not going to go be there. What if my carrier mobile internet got hacked? What do you have to recommendation to secure my privacy? What if my carrier mobile internet got hacked? What does that mean, got hacked? They got your username, password? Change your password. Are you concerned about AI and the connection with CDBC? If you would just please watch my CDBC video, that has been suppressed by YouTube. YouTube suppressed CDBC. So I removed the name CDBC from the video and just called it uh, digital dollars and see if that makes any difference. But uh, that was a very well received video and then YouTube didn't share it outside of my user base. So it still got good amount of views uh, inside my user base, but it didn't go beyond. It, you know that should have reached, you know, hundred thousand views, and it did not. It it just abruptly stops. It went all the way up and then stop. That's because that's a sign that the algorithm didn't select it. And I think the reason they didn't select it is because they perceived it to be conspiracy theory. That's my guess. And then they started to uh, shadow ban me again, meaning the algorithm disfavored me. I must have been put into the uh, conspiracy theory uh, list again. And then I got to fight to convince the algorithm that that's not an issue. Okay, I'm running out of time, of course. So next week, I will also do Friday. So I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I was just... Uh, having some conflicts here on Thursdays uh, because I went and saw a concert. So I, I went to see, uh, you know, the concerts. I'm going to see Herbie next week, Herbie Hancock, and that's Thursday. So, yeah. So for the next uh, uh, week as well, I'll be on on Friday, and then we'll be back to Thursday. So that's just temporary while I uh, just, you know, Enjoy some music once in a while. So, yeah. Now, now, if you're actually uh, wondering uh, about music, some of you are saying, you know, where's the piano intro? And I don't really have time to do a piano intro. And I don't want to do that when I'm doing Rumble. But you didn't go watch my uh, Rob Braxman jazz channel. So there's a Rob Braxman jazz channel. I had a gig. I posted music from last week's gig. And then uh, I'm going to post part two of that. Uh, but, you know, not too many of you watched it. So if you're really interested in my music, it's on Rob Braxman Jazz Channel. And uh, part two will be posted uh, this weekend. So go, go there and follow me if you're not on the Rob Braxman Jazz Channel. 
Kathy, do you watch the Rob Braxman Jazz Channel? So it's there. And, um, yeah. Haven't seen the gig yet. Was busy. Okay, so yeah. So please, uh, it's not going to leave. It's still there. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next Friday for the live stream. And then next Wednesday for the standard video. Let's see. How do I... Got to figure out how to turn this off. Hold on, that'll cause a delay here. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to turn it off right here. Thank you. Thank you for watching.